Well, what I plan on doing as we look at Psalm 119 is I'm going to take you through Psalm 119 in a different way. Let's begin together here in Psalm 119 at verse 1. I'm going to read the first eight verses, then I'm going to go into an introduction, explain to you how we're going to handle this, and then we'll move into our study. Let's begin reading here in Psalm 119 at verse 1. I'll read to verse 8, and we'll get into our study. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with a whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. Then I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm as well as the longest chapter in the entire Bible. There are 176 verses, and almost every verse in Psalm 119 praises the Lord for His Word. Now, as we go through this, you're going to see that the psalmist speaks of God's law, which is His Torah, which is His teaching and instruction. He speaks concerning God's testimonies, which is His witness of Himself. He speaks of his precepts, which is the things that they must do, his statutes, which are specific commands, his commandments, which speaks of his orders, his judgments, which are specific laws that promote justice, and he speaks of his ordinances, which is what is proper or fitting. He also uses phrases like your word or your words or the word of truth. We're going to be seeing that in almost every verse of Psalm 176. But there are a few verses that uh, do not specifically speak of God's Word. For example, verse 3, where he says, They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Or verse 37, Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Verse 84, How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? Verse 90, your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. Verses 121 and 122, I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the proud oppress me. Verse 132, which simply says, look upon me and be merciful to me as your custom is towards those who love your name. And then finally, verse 149, which simply says, uh, hear my voice according to your loving kindness, O Lord, revive me according to your justice. Every other verse there speaks concerning his word, his precept, his law, his command, his statutes. And the bottom line is, is he's giving to us insight into what is important to God. As Christians... We need to learn to emphasize what God emphasizes. I think in our day, uh, there is too much emphasis on uh, church growth methodologies and programs that are attempting to cause people to come into the church. As a matter of fact, there's this big movement. It's called the seeker-friendly movement, and it's an attempt to make people feel welcome. Uh, and in order to do so, the uh, people who don't have a relationship with the Lord, uh, in order to make them feel welcome, what they do is they water down the message of God. And what happens is it dilutes the message of Jesus Christ. Listen and remember always, when Jesus Christ went forward and gave his message, very often the things that he had to say were very cutting. They spoke to the heart. And often he demanded things from people. He made statements to them that caused them to have to make a decision as to whether they're going to follow him or whether they're going to reject him. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a very direct message. And when we fail to give that message, when we don't emphasize the Word of God in the way that God Himself does, then what we end up doing is we cause people who come to church to feel that they are automatically Christians because they show up in a church service. But Jesus Christ taught us that there are times that He spoke and there are times that we will speak that causes people discomfort. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans in chapter 1 in verse 16 said this. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the message. And so as we go through Psalm 119, we need to see how God emphasizes the importance of His Word. 
And in seeing how God emphasizes the importance of His Word, we too ought to emphasize this Word. Now, as you look at this particular psalm, the psalmist has arranged it in, in a very careful order. It's, it's what is called an acrostic psalm. What he has done is he's divided this psalm into 22 sections, each section containing eight verses. You're going to see that. That's why I read the first eight verses to you. And each one of those sections, actually the eight verses, begins with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, the Hebrew alphabet contains 22 letters. So that means that verses 1 through 8 begin, all those verses begin with the same letter, which would be the first letter of the Jewish alphabet. And then verses 9 through 16 following all begin with the second letter, third letter, fourth letter to the 22nd letter. And so he's divided the 176 verses into 22 sections, each one of those sections containing eight verses, each one of those verses beginning with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, obviously, as we look at this particular psalm, I can't give a detailed teaching of every verse. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the eight verses at a time. I only read the first eight to you, but I'm not going to do that the rest of the psalm. What I'm going to do is I'll pick, up, uh, pick some verses out of each one of those sections, maybe one verse, maybe two, and that'll be representative of that particular section of the psalm. And so as we begin here in Psalm 119, we begin with the first two verses because I believe that those first two verses give us insight into the entire psalm and, and what he would have us to know. So beginning at verse 1 and reading to verse 2 and getting into our study, the psalmist again says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. The word blessed means extremely happy. It speaks of being overjoyed. And he says, extremely happy are the undefiled. The word undefiled means innocent or unimpaired. It speaks of people with integrity. And what he's saying is God is going to cause the one totally trusting in him to have an incredibly joyful and blessed life. Now, that joy comes, according to the Word of God, from the Word of God. It comes because you have a full commitment to him. Notice verse 2, he said, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, now notice, who seek him with the whole heart. So if I want to have a relationship with the Lord that is really bountiful, if I want to have a blessed experience, if I want to have an existence that has joy, then I seek the Lord with all of my heart, not just a portion of it, but I pursue the Lord with everything that's in me. I pursue Him with all of my heart. I desire to have that, and therefore I trust Him in that way. The Bible in Jeremiah 29, 13, God speaking, says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And so from the very beginning, as the psalmist begins to lay for us, lay out for us uh, the ways of the Lord, he says, the bottom line is this. There's an innocent joyfulness that you have when you follow God with all of your heart. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. Now, the second portion, verses 9 and 11, how can a young man cleanse his way? by taking heed according to your word. Verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. How can a young man cleanse his way? How can my life be cleansed? And how can I live a life that is blessed? Well, it comes through the word of God. Remember Jesus in John 15, verse 3. Remember that Jesus said, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And how it says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that Jesus wants to sanctify and cleanse the church by the washing of water with the Word. How can a young man have a life that is pure? He says, by listening to what God has to say. How can a young man have a life that is clean before God? Well, by hiding God's Word in your heart. That's what he says in verse 11. Your Word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, when he says... This is how a young man is going to cleanse his way, by, by hiding God's Word in his heart. Many times I have looked at that Scripture and simply seen it as, as an encouragement to, to take God's Word and to memorize it. But as you consider that for just a moment, the fact is there are a lot of kids in Sunday schools, our Sunday school, memorize the Scripture that are still little monsters. You know, so they may be memorizing Scripture, but it's not transforming their lives. There are a lot of people who, who memorize portions of Scripture, but it, it doesn't do anything. So when he says, uh, your word have I hidden in my heart, it's not simply that I have memorized it. Your word have I placed in my heart, have I guarded in my heart, have I treasured in my heart, 
And as I have placed your word in my heart, I have demonstrated the value of your word by obeying it. So it's not enough that I simply memorize what the Word of God says, and I encourage you to do that. But it's with the attitude of memorization with application. I want to know the Scriptures, and the way to know those Scriptures is by making up my mind that what I know I will do, because that's the best way to ever understand a passage in the Scripture, is to determine that as I read this book here called the Bible, I'm going to put it into practice, and in doing so, I'm going to be transformed in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, uh, the apostle said, You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. And so how can a young man cleanse his way? Well, by taking heed according to your word. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Moving into the next letter, verse 18. In verse 18, he says, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. We need to understand that even as the psalmist is saying here, it's the Holy Spirit who gives us illumination. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us the ability to comprehend what God's Word has to say. God's Word is written to those who trust in Him. And were the Lord not to open your eye of understanding, then you could pursue this Bible and memorize this Bible the rest of your life, and it would do you absolutely no good. You could memorize it from Genesis to Revelation, but unless God opens your understanding of the Scripture, then all that is is information. But when the Holy Spirit of God begins to illuminate you, when the Holy Spirit of God begins to reveal to you the things of God, well, that's what the psalmist is saying. Open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things from your law. Open my eyes that I might be able to see what it is that you have for me. Some of you might have picked up the Bible before you became a Christian, and you might have read some of those scriptures, and you might have thought, well, that's kind of boring, and it's not very interesting, and it doesn't seem to apply, and I don't know what it's meaning. But you get saved, and you begin to read the scripture, and you begin to find something. You begin to find, you know, some of this is making sense to me. Some of this I relate to. That's because God has begun to open your eyes. Now, when you read the Bible, one of the best things you can do is you can pray, God, open my eyes that I might behold these things. Open my eyes that I might understand what you are saying. Now, Jesus in John 14, 26 said this concerning the Holy Spirit. He said, the, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So it's the Holy Spirit of God who illuminates. It's the Holy Spirit of God who gives to us insight. So as you open the Word of God and read, you need to be praying, God, open my eyes. I want to see the things that you've hidden there for me. Moving into uh, verse 28, and by now you're saying, hey, you, you are going to be able to do all of this, right? <laughs> verse 28, my soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. God's Word is the solution for times of grief and our sorrow. That's where I get my strength from. And there have been times that we've gone through things, when I have gone through something as a, as a man, or my family has gone through something that has been painful. I've always appreciated the encouragement that I get from my friends, and I've always appreciated the love that I get from my family. But the comfort that has actually brought me out of grief has been more than the shared grief that I have with others who've gone through the same thing or are going through the identical thing. The strength that I've received over time and the encouragement I've come to receive has come from God's Word. And that's what the psalmist is saying, my soul melts. It melts with heaviness. In other words, I'm going through some time of sorrow and grief that is incredible. So what's the answer for this? Strengthen me according to your word. You see, when you get into the word of God, God's word is spirit and God's word is life. The psalmist in Psalm 27 verse 14 said this. Listen carefully. He said, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Or Isaiah tells us in chapter 40 verse 29 that the Lord gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, 
He increases strength. Jesus in John 16, verse 33 said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Where does your comfort come from? It comes from the Lord. Where does your comfort come from? It comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. Who is my strength? My strength is the Lord. He's my high tower. He's my defense. He's the rock that I hide myself in. How do I know that? I know that from entering into the Word of God, and I know that as the Word of God has entered into me. And so when I've gone through times of despair and when I've gone through times of discouragement, I have found the answer is in God's Word. Now, I've been asked to do some ministry. I'll be doing it next week. I'm going to be teaching at a Southern California Pastors Conference. And um, I've been asked to teach a main session as well as two workshops. And, and the theme this year is going to relate to, uh, to overcoming and also discouragement in ministry. And, and I was thinking about that theme, and I, was, uh, I uh, produced a, uh, a message yesterday that I'll be sharing but it's a message that the Lord gave to me many years ago. Very briefly, I'm not going to give you that message now, don't worry, but very briefly in it, one of the passages of Scripture that God spoke to my heart many years ago now is found in, in, in the Gospel of John when, when Jesus has just given a tremendous message concerning the fact that, that his, 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 his flesh is, is life to people who, who consume it and his blood is to be drunk in order for them to have life within them. And, and as he's speaking concerning eating my flesh and drinking my blood, or, or you will not have any life in you, those who are listening to him as he's teaching in a synagogue in the city of Capernaum, as he's speaking that message to them, those who are listening to him uh, begin to say, and they say this, and it's recorded in Scripture, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When they say this is a hard saying, this is difficult to comprehend, this is beyond what we were expecting. Who can understand it? What are you talking about? And as Jesus speaks, the, the synagogue uh, basically disrupts, and the people get up, and they walk out. And as they're walking out, Jesus is there with his disciples. And, and as he sees these people melting off in the distance, these, these people who had been listening to him just a moment before as he was sharing tremendous words, as he sees them walk away, he turns to his disciples, and he asks them a question, do you want to go away also? Do you want to go away also? And I believe with all of my heart that there's a time in every believer's life where you will hear the Lord speak a question like that to you. When God turns out to be a little bit different than you thought he was, you got saved, you thought everything would be wonderful that, from that point on. You never thought you'd have another, another tough time. You knew that everything was okay. I'm going to heaven and I've got the Spirit of God. I've got fellowship. My sins are forgiven. I've got everything I need. And you thought, man, it's going to be wonderful. And then trials began to hit you and afflictions began to hit you and people began to not care for you anymore and, and some began to just forsake you. And before you know it, you're feeling all left alone and the things that were most important to you are suddenly gone or taken from you. They're stripped from you, and you begin to wonder, what's going to happen in my life? And I remember a certain portion of my, my spiritual life when, when I went through something that, that caused me great pain, and, and I was reading that passage that I'm quoting to you out of John chapter 6, and, 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 and as I was reading that, I, I got to the words where Jesus said, do you also want to go away? And I remember closing the Bible as I was reading it, and I closed the Bible on my hand, and I kept my place there. And I looked up to the ceiling, and I began to speak to the Lord in prayer, and I said to him, where can I go? I have no friends. I've been going to Bible college because I, be, I believe that I was called to be a pastor. And everything that I had at one time is gone because I gave it up. And it's just me, and I don't know where I am with you right now, Lord. I don't know what to do. Where can I go? What can I do? I've given it all up to pursue you, and right now I don't know if that was a good deal or not. And I remember opening up the passage and continuing it when the apostle Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, my help and your help comes from the Lord. It comes from his word. That's where it comes from. It doesn't come from a friendly phone call of somebody who loves you, though that is part of the hand of the Lord as he does bring ministry to you. But it comes from the word. It comes from the fact that you come to realize it's just you and Jesus. Even your best friends won't understand you. Even a husband or a wife or your children or your parents really will never truly understand you. There's only one person who really understands you, 
and he knows you, and he still likes you, which is an amazing thing to me. I mean, he knows everything about me, and he still loves me. And so where does your comfort come from? Where does mine come from? Well, it comes from the Lord. So he says in verse 28, my soul melts from heaviness, strengthen me according to your word. Moving on and looking at verse 37, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Now, this is interesting, and I'm actually going to read this section to you from verse 33 to verse 40. I want you to see something here. Notice in verse 33, and I'll just read it. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. This section is interesting because the psalmist keeps saying things like, teach me, give me, make me, incline my heart, turn away my eyes, establish your word, turn away my reproach. As a matter of fact, he says, revive me twice. He says it in verse 37 as well as verse 40. And what he's doing here is simply asking God to do his work in him. God has his part that he does. I have my part that I do. Sometimes I can get caught up trying to do my part, and I forget to ask, Lord, please, God, I need you to do your part. Because if I'm trying to do my part, then eventually, you know what? I become a Pharisee. I become a person who is so caught up trying to make myself good that I eventually just ace God out, and he doesn't need to work. The Bible tells us very clearly we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling for us God, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do according to his purpose. Work out your own salvation is my part, for it is God who works in you is his. And as long as I understand that I'm living out the salvation God has given to me and he's empowering me to live a life that is pleasing to him, I'm okay. But if I get to the point where I start thinking it's my responsibility to sanctify myself through my own efforts, at that point I'm in danger because I'm going to become a very rigid Pharisee. And so as he's praying here, he says, turn away my eyes, in verse 37, from looking at worthless things, revive me in your way. Now when he says, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things, that word worthless speaks of vanity, nothingness, or emptiness. Turn my eyes away from things that are empty. I was reading something today you might find interesting. It is estimated that advertisers spend $236 billion yearly on print, radio, television, and online advertising to get the word out on their products and their services. $236 billion in advertising. It is estimated, check this one out, it is estimated that the average American is exposed to over 2,500 ads a day. Now, a lot of you say, that's not true. We are inundated and bombarded constantly by commercials. When you drive to church, there are billboards. When you drive to work, there are billboards, there's advertising everywhere. We just don't notice it. We're actually insulating ourselves against it. You watch television, and every three or four minutes, you have a commercial. And as you watch the commercial, it has one minute, another minute, two minutes, three, five, six minutes of that program are taken up at, 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 you know, by commercials. We are inundated constantly. You go to your mail. You open it up and you have junk mail. You open up your, your, uh, your email on your computer and you're filled with messages. You know, every time I leave for a few days and come back, I will find 500 emails and they're all advertising. They're all advertising. You know, one thing after another, they're trying to sell me. We are inundated with worthless things. 
And a lot of times what we do is we're watching them. We may even give money as we go to a movie to watch a worthless thing. Or we spend hours in front of a television set watching worthless things. Or we buy, uh, you know, magazines and we read things that are worthless. And so he's simply saying here, turn my eyes away from them. Help me to have value in my life, to know what I should take my time to look at and what I should reject. Because not everything I look at is worth looking at. So cause me to desire is his point. And this is a wonderful prayer. Cause me to desire to see what you are pleased with seen. Change my heart, O oh God, that I will have a heart to see the things that you want me to see because they're the things that are pleasing to you. Verse 46, continuing, I will speak of your testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. Trusting God and trusting in God's Word and the power of God's Word will give you boldness. Trusting in the Word of God gives you boldness. I've discovered that to be true. I've discovered that when you believe the message of the gospel is absolutely true, you'll speak to politicians and share with them. You'll speak to people who, who may not have a, a sympathy towards what you believe, and you won't be afraid because you are believing the Word of God is absolutely the Word of God. As a young man, and, and, and forgive me if I have to use myself as an illustration, as a young man, I'm in college. Uh, I had graduated from high school at the age of 17, uh, just barely. I, I, I think I might have had a D-minus average when I graduated from high school. The only books that I ever read were comic books. The only book that I picked up and actually read cover to cover was a book I stole from the library when I was 19. It was a Fellowship of the Ring, and when I got saved shortly thereafter, I took it back and gave it back to the library. But, um, you know, I just wasn't somebody who read uh, anything and, uh, and all of that. And so, for me, uh, I, you know, I was a very uneducated man. I was, and so, I got saved, and, and say this very briefly, went into the military three months after getting saved and uh, was in the army and all, and, and I used to drive a truck, and, and I didn't have anything to do all day. And, and so what I would do is I, would, I started buying books and I started to read. And that's how I began to educate myself in the things of the Lord and also to establish a vocabulary. I had a book. I had several books by a, an author, an existentialist German by the name of Hermann Hesse. And I began to read his material simply to, to, to see what he had to say. And, and I couldn't understand his words. And so I actually bought a dictionary and I would read what he was writing and I would open the dictionary up, and that's how I expanded my vocabulary. I learned what he believed, and I learned how to debate what he believed, and that's what I did when I was in the military. And I got to the point where I, on one occasion in a week, I was reading two books a day, and I started just to expand. That's what I did, because I wanted to grow. I wanted to be the kind of person that God could use, and I felt that God had given me some time to read and all of that. But the bottom line is, is when I got out of the military, I went to uh, Bible college, but I also went to secular universities. And when I went to secular universities, I began to meet uh, teachers that had earned doctorates, earned masters, and some with multiple, multiple degrees and all. And I got to the point where I was intimidated by them. And I would think, they know so much. They have read so much. They're so learned. I mean, they spent their life, you know, obtaining information and education and, and those letters behind their name. And, and all I am is a D-minus student who just barely got out of high school. And I'm, you know, what do I know? And I had a friend of mine, and my friend Nick spoke to me one day, and he said, David, let me tell you something. He said, you have a literature professor. My liter literature professor had two PhDs and a master's degree. He said, I, will, I guarantee you that, that she has not read the Bible. He said, now, you've been a Christian. At that time, I'd been a Christian about four years. He said, four or five years. He said, you in four or five years have read the Bible and have studied the Bible and are actually now teaching the Bible, I guarantee you she's never read it. And so that was like, we'll say, on a Tuesday. And, and Wednesday I had class with the professor. So I waited after class for her. And I walked outside the door with her. And I said, you know, it's kind of like in the book of Job. And I started quoting Scripture to her. And she looks at me and she says, do you want to know something? I have never read the Bible. And I said, gotcha, gotcha. All you need is confidence that God's Word is true. Now, notice how I said that. I didn't say all you need is confidence because there are a lot of people with confidence, 
but they're still dumb. <laughs> you have to have confidence in God's Word and quote His Word. And I promise you, as you do so, it's not always going to be pleasant. It doesn't always bring great results. I mean, sometimes people get mad at you. I had a guy in one of my classes say to me in the same college, say to me, can't you answer a question without quoting a scripture? And I said, why would I erase my worldview if I have received this information from scripture? That is my worldview. Therefore, I will use that as I communicate in this class. Why would I cease using scripture? That's my framework of reference. And you learn how to communicate like that, and you learn how to speak what the Word of God has to say. So what we do is we trust the Word of God. We trust God's Word, and it gives you confidence. So he says, I will speak of your testimonies before kings, and I will not be ashamed, because trusting God in His Word will give you boldness. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 18 through 20, Jesus said it this way. He said, you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. When they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. It will be given to you in that hour what you should speak, for it's not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. So God gives you His Word, and He gives you His Spirit, and He encourages you even as He fills your mouth with wonderful things from above. Verses 49 and 50. Remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. What a beautiful word from the Lord. God's word gives us hope, gives us comfort, and gives us life. So when asking God to remember his promises, he's reminding God of his own faithfulness. That's why he says, remember the word to your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. Lord, all I'm doing is reminding you that your word is my source of comfort. I'm just reminding you that your word is my life, and I'm reminding you that your word gives me hope because God is faithful, and his word is true. Numbers 23 verse 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do, or has he spoken? and will he not make it good? Verse 63. I am a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. When he says, I am a companion of all those who fear you, he's simply saying, I have chosen to have fellowship with those who are obedient to your word. I would remind you that your pastor, your pastor is often simply the person that you trust the most. Your pastor is the person that gives you advice, is the person who cares for you very often. You can come to a Bible study like this, and I'm the pastor of this fellowship, but I may not be your pastor. There are some in this fellowship who say, yes, you are. You are my pastor. You feed me the things of the, of the Spirit, His Word, and, 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 and you're my pastor, and, and, and this is my home. And there are many people who do that, but there are many, many people just show up in church. And so I'm really not their pastor. The one who is their pastor is the one they go out to drink coffee with after church on Wednesday night. The one is, who is their pastor is the one on Sunday when they together go out and grab something to eat after church, and then they discuss perhaps some of the message that they heard that day. And it's their pastor who will say, well, you know, Pastor David said this and that, you know, but uh, I'm not quite sure whether it really applies in this circumstance. This is the way I've seen it in my life. And even if I would have rightly divided the word and applied it properly and correctly, it may have caused conviction in the heart of that person who's speaking to you, and that person who's speaking to you being in conviction will say, I don't agree with that. So you, because you're not talking to me over, over lunch, you're talking to them, they're influencing you in the direction that you're going to live your spiritual life. Your pastor very often is the person who simply has the most influence in your life. Therefore, what he's saying here, be very careful who you allow to be the influencer in your life. Be very careful who you allow to do that. He said, I'm a companion of all those who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33 says it this way, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. If I have a friend who gives himself over to sin 
And I have no problem with that. Eventually, what's going to happen is I'm going to be influenced by him and his sin. Evil company corrupts good morals. Evil company does. You begin to make excuses for them. The Bible in Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Be very careful who you allow to influence you in your life, especially in the area of the Spirit. But be very, very careful. Moving on to verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Now, when he says, it is good for me that I've been afflicted, the word afflicted speaks of being weakened. It speaks of being humbled. It can even speak of depression. It's good for me that I've been down. When he says that I may learn your statutes, the word learn speaks of being trained by God's word. It can carry the connotation of learning by experience. It is good for me that I have gone through heaviness because in going through the heaviness, I've learned your faithfulness. It's good for me that I've been down because when I've been down, I called out to you and you showed me your faithfulness. It's good for me when I had my back against the wall and I had nowhere to turn and I turned to you because you showed me that you would be there for me and with me in that hard time. It's good for me because in my mind, I've had all of these scriptures, and by the way, I've been able to quote them to other people in similar circumstances, but it's good for me that I have gone through this time because I've discovered the depth of your love and your goodness for me. And you want to know something? Once again, guys, that's how we learn scripture. Again, not simply through the memorization of it, but by the application of it. That's how we learn how deep God goes. One of my professors at Biola said to me, no matter how deep you go, God is deeper still. And I've discovered that. No matter how down I go, God is deeper still. He's still underneath me, and he's still holding me up. And so he said, it is good. I've come to know the truth of your word because I've seen you fulfill your promises in my life. Now, Paul would be referring to something like that when he was writing to the Philippians. If you'd like, turn your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 4. I'll give you an opportunity to wake up. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4. I want you to see something here in this passage. It's found in verses 10 through 13. In the New Testament book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul writes these words, Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. He said, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How did you learn that, Paul? Well, because I've been in time of plenty and I've been in time of need. I've been in time when I felt on top of the world and, I have, and there have been times when the world was crushing me, crushing me beneath it. I have been there in all those circumstances and I've discovered that no matter what I'm going through, whatever state I find myself in, and he's not talking about Arizona, Nevada, California, whatever condition I find myself in, whatever state I find myself in, I have discovered I can be content. The secret of contentment, contentment is simply being in the center of the will of God. I've discovered that I can be at peace if I've got money in my pocket, and I've discovered I can be at peace if I don't have any. I've discovered I can be at peace if my stomach is full because I had a wonderful dinner, and I've discovered I can be at peace if I have nothing in my stomach. I've discovered this because God has shown me in every way that he loves me. And knowing that he loves me, well, that's all that matters. 
So I have discovered these things. And that's why back, as we turn on back, that's why the psalmist is pointing out, it was good. It's good that I've gone through this heaviness. It's good that I've gone through affliction. And, and let me tell you something, by the way, as you're turning back, those of you who turn to Philippians, that is the mark of a spiritually mature person, an individual who stops blaming God for every bad thing that happens to them and questioning God about everything that's happening and simply saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. God gives and God takes away. And he is the Lord. And I am just clay in his hands. And I, as the clay vessel, have no right to turn to the potter and say, say to him, what are you doing with me? Because the clay can't speak to the master potter and say that. God fashions us through affliction very often because we have cried out and said, we want to have a heart like yours. God, I want to be like you. That's what a Christian is. It's a person who's like Jesus. And so we say, Lord, I want to be like you. And the Lord says, well, are you sure? Oh, yes, Jesus, I love you, Lord. I want to be like you. Are you sure? Yes. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. And the Lord says, read Isaiah 53 again, and let's talk. Because when you read about what I went through, and you say you want to be like me, are you ready? And if you say yes, he will bring you through that process. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He never gives up on you, and he continues the work until it's complete. But you can get to certain points in your life where you begin to say, maybe I made a mistake. I thought you were different than this. And it's kind of like in Matthew 11 when, when Jesus has a visit by a couple of disciples of John the Baptist. And they walk up to him after the master, their master, John the Baptist, who's in jail about to lose his head for his witness. And he says, I want you to go and speak to Jesus of Nazareth. And I want to ask you, ask him, are you the coming one or should we look for another? You see, guys, I'm about to lose my head and I want to make sure that it's cut off for the right person. So could you go and please ask him? You see, because when Matthew speaks concerning the ministry of John the Baptist, he points out that John the Baptist preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the first message that he records in Matthew chapter 4 that Jesus spoke is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They had a similar message. So John is thinking this is the one, and God had pointed that out. But Jesus doesn't seem to be doing the things that John thinks that Messiah is supposed to do. And therefore, he says, go and ask him. Perhaps I made a mistake. I'm about to die, and I want to make sure I die for the right person. So he comes, <laughs> rather, he sends his, his boys there. They speak to Jesus. Are you the coming one? Should we look for another? And he begins to do ministry to them. He fulfills scripture to them. And then he says, you go back and you tell John the things that you've seen. And then he gives him this message and tell him, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. What an interesting thing to say. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. What are you saying, Jesus? Blessed is the one who allows me to be who I am and doesn't try to create me into the God they think I'm supposed to be. I am God. You are clay. I do with you as I will because I'm your master. So he can say it's good for me that I have been afflicted. Why? Because I've learned through experience the trustworthiness of your word and it developed maturity in me. And I have prayed that I might know you and this is how I have come to know you. Verse 73. You only have a hundred more to go. <laughs> Verse 73. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. God is our maker. His word is his manual that keeps his creation running well. Seeing that he made us, he knows exactly what we need. And his word reveals that to us. Verse 83, for I have become like a wineskin in smoke, yet I do not forget your statutes. This is an interesting scripture. The wineskin is a leather bottle. This leather bottle that contains obviously the liquid has been placed next to an open fire. Obviously over time, it's now charred and because of the heat, it's dried up. The point he's making is God's word brings refreshment when we are dried up or parched through our troubles. And there are times that we may be dried up, but we get into the word of God and he fills us up once again. Verse 93, 
I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I will never forget your precepts. God's Word gives us spiritual life. And by the way, it's God's Word that brings spiritual life. That's why we get into His Word. And I could actually go off on this for some time. I'm going to be careful not to. I will say this again. Throughout the United States, there's a tremendous movement going on right now where many ministers are actually more intent on getting people to get into, the, into their room so they can build big ministries and have booming churches. There are many ministers that are so after that that they're no longer teaching God's Word to congregations. And uh, as a result of that, there are a lot of testimonies and programs and methods, and people do show up because they want to know what's the next thing that he's going to do but they're not being fed spiritually. And, and I've been around now long enough to see various cycles that have hit the church. There was a time when a lot of worship and a little word was pretty much the fair of the day in many churches. So you would go to church and you'd get 45 minutes of singing in a 15-minute Bible study. But I've often thought, well, that may be emotionally uplifting and all, but seeing that you're not getting in the Word, what's going to happen when a cult member knocks on your door and wants to tell you what they believe? What are you going to do, bring your tambourine out and sing to them, our God is an awesome God? I mean, it isn't going to work. <laughs> you need to have the Word of God. You need to know what God's Word has to say, you see. And so that's the point he's making. Your Word has given me life. In John 6, verse 63, the Scripture says, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. God's Word brings life. Verse 100. <sighs> Just saying 100 made me tired. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. Isn't that interesting? I understand more than the ancients. The word ancients means the aged or those who are older in society. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. So a young person can have more wisdom than an older person because the young person has taken into their life God's Word. Paul, when he was writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, said, From childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. A young person can speak the Word of God and have more wisdom because they're in the Word of God, and it draws people. There's a young man in Thailand right now. His name is James. He's 27 years old. He's been a believer and serving and growing in discipleship for a little less than three years. And he's in Thailand. And I was having a meeting recently with Jerry, a friend of mine, who's, we're, we're, we're working together to plant a, a work there in Thailand, in southern Thailand. And Jerry was showing me some pictures. And in the picture, he shows me a picture of this young man, James. And James is speaking in a tent in southern Thailand to a group of children, and there's some adults there with the kids. But in the background, there are two Buddhist monks. These two Buddhist monks are wearing saffron robes. They're beautiful gold robes. And they're standing behind listening to this young man who's 27 years old. These are two older men who've given their life to Buddhism to being monks. They're wearing their robes. They're full initiates. They are Buddhist monks. They're listening to this young guy opening the Bible through a translator, community, communicating the gospel, and these two Buddhist monks gave their hearts to Jesus Christ and removed their robes and said, we're going to follow Jesus now. That's amazing. That is amazing. And that's what takes place. This is a young guy speaking to men who are scholars who their lifetime has been devoted to the study of Buddhist doctrine who heard the gospel and said, what we have seen through the Christian faith, what we have seen through you Christians coming here to care for our people, have told us that what you have is truth, what you have is real. And one of them has been showing up to every Bible study that he gives, is devouring the Word of God because he wants to know Jesus Christ better and better. I have more wisdom than the ancients because I keep your precepts. Verse 105. Verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
God's Word gives us that flashlight as we walk in the darkness of this world. My assistant, Mike, has a pocket flashlight. And when he walks with me through here, because in this auditorium during the day, all the lights are off, it's pitch black, I'm night blind. So I will stand at the door there. Mike will walk in front of me, and he turns on a flashlight. As he turns on the flashlight, I can see the steps. If he doesn't turn on the flashlight, if he's mad at me, <laughs> I'm going down those steps. And he's walked in here many times, and he's seen me standing here. Just I'll be standing like this, and I'm waiting to see if I can make an outline out, and then he'll see me do this, and I count the steps, because I really can't see it. I'm night blind. That's just the way it is. I cannot see in the dark. And so before you're born again, you walk in darkness. But God's Word is a lamp and a light. He enlightens your path, and that's the point that he's making. Jesus said to us in John chapter 8, verse 12, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Verse 114, you are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. You are my hiding place and my shield. You are my defense. You are my strength. One of the things about God's Word is that it provides for us weaponry for the, uh, the spiritual war that we're in. When Paul was writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, he said, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. God's Word is our defense and our strength. Verse 126, it is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. I think that's a good prayer for the church today. Lord, it's time to rise and it's time to move. And we want the world to see that we worship an awesome God. In Psalm 9, verse 19, the psalmist said, Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. There's a time for us to pray, Lord, would you please move? I had an interview today. A, a local newspaper reporter came in, real sweet gal, and she came in to in interview me, and I guess I don't know when it's going to be put in the, in the newspaper and all, but we were speaking, and as we spoke, uh, I said something to her uh, uh, about um, uh, American mentality and materialism and all, and, uh, and a conversation I had had with somebody who, um, who had, and I started talking to her a little bit about that, and she said to me this, she said, she said, is it okay for a Christian to get angry? She asked me that. I said, shut up. No, she said, is it okay? <laughs> and I'll punch you in the head. <laughs> I said, you know what? <laughs> I said, there's a place for righteous indignation. A child is hurt, you should get angry. There are times when something is wrong, there's an injustice, that you need to have a righteous anger over that. The other day, I'm driving with my daughter, and there's a car pulled over on the side of the road, and, and I see a little girl about three years old standing, and she's wearing a little hat and a little flowered dress, little teeny thing. I happen to have a real love for small children. I love babies. I just love the kids. I really love them. So I see this little girl, and I'm with my daughter, and as I'm driving, I see her little hands are on her face, and she's crying. So I slowed down. And as I slowed down, I see her mother in the car pretending that she's going to drive away and leave that baby on the side of the road. And the baby's crying. And then the mom gets out and puts her in the car. I see this as I'm pulling up. I got so angry. How could you do that to that precious little lamb? You're her mommy. She trusts you. And if you're threatening to leave her alone in the middle of the road, what's wrong with you? But there are a lot of women who do that and worse, and a lot of men who do that 
and worse. Should you get upset about that, or should you say, oh, big deal? There is a place for that kind of anger, absolutely. There's a place for that. My daughter, Anna, told me, Daddy, if it was Crin and me, we'd be over on the side of the road, and that woman would be talking to us. She said, because she got just as angry as I did. There's a place for that, guys. There's a place for seeing wrong and wanting to change it. And there's a time where we can say, Lord, it is time for you to act, Lord. It's time for you to move, Lord. So I said to this young lady, I said, yes, there are times that we ought to get upset when injustice is done, when something is wrong, of course. Verse 136. We're almost there. About an hour. Rivers of water run down from my eyes because men do not keep your law. He's simply saying, it breaks my heart that people don't love you, Lord. It breaks my heart that they ignore you. And by the way, rivers of water, well, I think that that's the heart of every genuine Christian. It should be the heart of every believer. Lord, it breaks my heart that people don't love you. Lord, it breaks my heart that people don't love your word. And every preacher who is worth his salt ought to have tears because people reject the word of God. Because as you go forth with a broken heart, very often God uses your tears to water his word and draw people to salvation. Verse 151. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Very simply put, either God's word is true or it's not true. Trusting in the word of God produces a power for victorious life. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Again, that's the power of the preacher. Verse 159, consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. Revival of your spiritual life will always come through the Word of God. And that's why he says, consider how I love your precepts and revive me. The Word of God, once again, is at the heart of every spiritual revival. Verse 162, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. When he says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure, the word find means to acquire or to hunt for. It speaks of securing. In other words, your word is as valuable to me as if I were a treasure hunter seeking my fortune. And I get up early, and I pursue it till the end of the day. Then the next day, I get up early and pursue it because I want that fortune. Inasmuch as I desire to have that fortune, well, Lord, I have the same desire to have your word in my heart. So, of course, if you're going to grow in the things of the Lord, growth always is a result of spiritual discipline, pursuit of the Lord. And then finally... Verse 176, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. This is a beautiful word to backsliders. You see, if there's a longing in your heart, if there's an emptiness in you where you say, God, I once tasted of you, I once loved your word, and, 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 and I'm dry now. If you have that, then, then you ought to take this as your own. I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. I do not forget your commandments. Lord, like a sheep that's out there in the wilderness. I'm out there on my own. You are the good shepherd. Seek me out. I have a desire to be found by you, Lord. And you want to know something? If you're a backslider today, if you've wandered away from the Lord, this is a great scripture for you. Because like a lost sheep can walk away from their shepherd, even so, that shepherd is out there looking for that lost sheep. And that's what the Lord has been doing for you all this time. And he's crying out even tonight and saying to you, if you want to be found, I'm here for you.